Everybody, welcome to What the Tech. I'm Andrew Zarian on this very warm New York day. It is yeah. 88 degrees in the studio, not outside, in the studio. Uh, so I'm going to probably melt by the end of the show. But of course, I'm joined by the one, the only, Mr. Wind Superside himself, Paul Therat. How you doing, Paul? You know what I just realized? What did you just realize? <laughs> I didn't. Do we do we have show notes for this week? Uh n- in my mind, I do, but okay. I never. No, that's shared fine. It I just, it's always better for me if um, it's not me. No, no, no. It's, <laughs> you know what I mean. It's me. It's okay. not you. No, that's good. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, okay. You know, I I didn't. I just didn't, uh, you know I feel like I'm. I'm yeah, you know something. what it was. I didn't send show notes because I know what the rest of the show is going to be, and I, I kind of it's going to probably be like two topics because there's so much to talk about, and we still have stuff left over from Google I/O from Thursday because we did the show on Thursday last week. Yeah, and. For whatever reason, okay, and it, it it happens every now and then. I got either people loved last week's show, or they were so mad at us. Uh, last what was last Thursday? Week? So we did the Google I/O stuff. There were people who were mad, very angry. Really? What were they mad about? I, you know, just I think a lot of people took it as we're bashing Google on the security stuff. Like, on the, um, I think we made a joke that, you know, in the beginning, they're like, well, we know every step that you're taking, and we know this, and we know that. And, yeah. you know, we were pointing out the obvious, that they, they have all this information on you. And for whatever reason, I mean, that was a trigger for a lot of people. And I'm not saying nobody else is doing it. Everybody's doing it. Just mm, all there, I'm is saying. Is anyone doing it? I think, you know. <laughs> I mean, I, Facebook. I, I, they knew there were 93 million selfies. Yeah. So by the way, I, uh, this is a weird coincidence, uh, but now that you're mentioning this, I was uh, I walk not quite every day, but I try to walk every day. I usually listen to audiobooks, and the audiobook I'm listening to right now is a bunch of short stories. And for whatever reason, I don't know if it's because of stuff that's going on or the story itself wasn't very interesting, but I was zoning out and zoning out and zoning out. And about 30 minutes into the walk, I was like, okay, I got to stop listening to this. I got to listen to something that I'm actually going to listen to. What could that be? And you know what I did? I'm what? not going to tell you what podcast it was. I don't want to call anyone out. Okay. But I listened to a tech podcast, which is something I never do. Ah. Uh-huh. And I listened to people talk about this Google event that you were now the people have now complained about our coverage of. And I had the exact opposite experience, which was I'll try to imitate the way they described this exact thing we just talked about, which was that one of the people, one of the co-hosts, said, "Oh, and and they um." They announced that uh, 93 million people take uh, selfies with an Android phone. And one of the other guys said, how do they know that? And then one of the other guys said, I don't know, facial recognition? And then they all went, <laughs> okay. And, and that was literally the depth of the questioning about how do they Google's know? Yeah. Do, collection of this data. That yeah. um, uh, the, the people who love Google, people who cover Google, they don't think about this stuff. And uh, I'm sorry, um, if you take exception to people wondering aloud about the integrity of a company like Google, um, I mean, I mean no offense, but you've got to be kidding me. Listen, um, I would I, be much more worried about those goons who couldn't care less that Google is doing what it's doing. I, I find that to be I, uh, dangerous and stupid. I, I actually, I actually that was like, amazing to me. I, you know, I complain about Android. But I never really complained about Android. I complained about my phone. I complained about the. Well, you, know, uh, you complain about Android because you use it. Because and I it's use important. it. And yeah, I mean that. And by the way, I would argue that gives you the right to complain about Android. Sure, I, um, I use it every day. And but yeah. I choose to use it because of of my weird reasoning. You know what? If I want my life to be simple, you know what I would do? I would go buy an iPhone. Then I never have to complain about anything. I just use the iPhone, and I'll be happy like everybody else. But I need to be in every environment. I have a Windows phone, and you know what? I'm critical of Windows phone. I'm critical of everything that I use. I'm critical critical of Microsoft. Uh, but when I look at Google, it I, and I look at Facebook, and these are services that collect data. They, they profit off of collecting data. Yep. That's how they make their money, yep. by, by collecting my habits and what I do and what I talk about and and that's why you, you send out an email and you got a little thing on the top that says, hey, you know, uh, I know you're talking about coffee. Here's a link to Folgers. Yeah. That, that, that's how they make their money. 
I am okay with it because I'm aware of what I do and what I put out there. What terrifies me is people that are not aware that this is happening and not right. aware that it's not okay to put everything on the internet. I know the risk. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I know whatever I do, whatever I see on the internet will haunt me for the rest of my life and it's always there. Sure. People don't know that. And what we, we do here is we point that out. And I want people to think about it. I want right. people to but say, right. and that's how, the do they, the, how do the, they have the this point, information? What are they doing with it? It's not like uh, Andrew and I have all the answers. We're, we're, we're much smarter than other people. I, that's not the point. The point is, is it, it is not true. <laughs> the, the point is to question it. You know, what's I, I, the sheer lack of questioning, you know, uh, for something like that, I, I find rather amazing. I mean, uh, I, Google is a company uh, that obviously makes incredible services that are valuable for many people. And, and I understand why people use that stuff. And I do. I do, too. I get it. Um, but we got to be careful about this stuff. You really you want to be on top of what's happening when Google, um, uh, like, for example, there were two big stories involving Google and Facebook this week. Google, with their street view, went to the Supreme Court and they were denied that it's going to have to go to court. They were stealing personal information for no good reason, and they lied about it. Uh, Facebook did a study with, I think, 700,000 users where they purposely skewed the results of their new their uh, timeline to show them overly negative or overly positive yeah. news to see if they could get a reaction out of them. That's messed up. That is messed up, yeah. <laughs> Both of those things are messed up. So, you know, it, it's not. I'm not suggesting that you should not use Facebook or that you should not use Google. Heads up, I use both of them. But I am suggesting you should be educated about it. And um, uh, anyone, you got to look at whether it's Google at Google I.O., Apple at WWDC, Microsoft at Build, um, Amazon at the recent phone announcement, uh, Facebook at whatever they announce. Y you you got to be a little rounded about what's going on there. You shouldn't be overly negative just to be negative, but you should be clear about what they're really saying and what they're not saying. And Absolutely. I don't know. To me, Listen, that's an actual I service. Have, I have, and, and, and if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. And sure. send me an email, and you know what? I'm the first to say, you know what? You actually have a, lot, a point there. I have changed my opinion on the Chromebook. Yeah. I, I've totally done a 180 on my, on my opinion of the Chromebook, I, and I still stand by the fact that the Chromebook may not be for me, but the Chromebook, and from what I've seen that they're developing, and I could kind of see the future of that device, it, it will become a threat for Microsoft in that entry-level market, in that entry-level right. PC market. Yeah, now, and, is it going to take over the market? Who knows? I don't know. I, I have no <laughs> idea what's going to happen in five, year, five years. Probably not. But it's enough of a threat for a lot of people. I thought it was the dumbest a lot thing. Of, um, now I see it. A lot of technology like that where um, by virtue of experience, uh, in this case with Mac, uh, Macs or Windows PCs, you can look at something like a Chromebook and it, your initial reaction is a bunch of negatives. You know, it doesn't do this. It doesn't do that. It doesn't do this. Um it's hard to put those things in perspective. I, I had the same reaction to the iPad because the Microsoft world had gone through tablets 10 years earlier. I understood them thoroughly. I could see that the iPad did not have handwriting recognition, uh, handwriting as a, a, an innate data like type in the system, um, a keyboard, you know, <laughs> a, a, a cursor, you know, all that kind of stuff. I, I saw that I saw it through this sort of lens of negativity. Um, it's, you know, but over time, perspective develops. And by the way, over time, those products also um, get better. I mean, I, I look at Chromebook repeatedly, despite the fact that I've trashed it, because I understand that it's going to improve over time. And, and the thing and the perspective that occurs over time is that you sort of see it in that perspective of, you know, most people can get what they need done on a tablet or a phone or both. Um, we don't use PCs, by and large, to do Facebook posts, to check into places, to do all these, you know, email, web browsing, reading books, you know, playing games. Yeah. Like most people do that stuff on these little devices. But, you know, every once in a while, those people, whether they're students or homemakers or whatever they are, semi-casual PC productivity users, they may need to type something. Uh, they may need to create an office document of some kind to do whatever it is they're trying to do. And when that kind of stuff happens, you know, a Chromebook can satisfy that need for some of those people, Absolutely. for a lot of those people. Absolutely. And that's, that's the perspective you have to kind of put it in. It doesn't have to replace Windows one-to-one. -one. It doesn't have to be exactly as good as it a MacBook It just has to be, be good enough. Can they bring it up and type something and print it or 
you know, say, whatever, probably not print it, but, <laughs> you know, uh, save it to some cloud service and, and submit it to a professor or do whatever it is they want to do it. And if the answer is yes, uh, then I would say, well, a Chromebook costs 250 bucks, and that's why people are buying them. Well, you, know? you wrote an article uh, last, I, I believe, last week, late last week, about the, uh, it was mostly about docs and, and Office, yeah, and yeah, yeah. you you said in I, I had the quote here and then I canceled it out. I had actually copied and pasted it, but you said essentially it doesn't have to be better or as good as you know Office. It just has to be good enough. Yeah, good. And enough. good enough is enough of a threat if enough people are saying, "Well, this is good enough." It's quick. It's dirty. Gets it done. That's it. Yeah. By the I way, it's important to note not just in technology but everywhere in life that. Um, good enough wins the day. Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, all the time. Yeah. And that's something to keep in perspective as well. Um, you know, the best car on earth is not the best selling car on earth ever because that car is really expensive. Um, you could you could apply it to any market. You know, we don't eat filet mignon every day, but we eat hamburger a lot. You know, I mean, it's um, good enough. It gets is, it gets it, it done. Is, yeah. Uh, I, and I think that's going to be a, a serious threat. There's this good enough concept. L listen, uh, cloud computing, uh, uh, cloud email. Is good enough. Yeah, good enough. It's that's not. By the way, that's exactly right. It's not uh, Outlook, and I was an Outlook user. I was a diehard Outlook user. It has. It doesn't have half the tools that Outlook had, but it's quick. You could log in. You don't have to. You don't have to have anything installed on the computer, and everything's on the cloud. You never have to worry about your PST file being corrupted. God forbid that happens to anybody else, because that happened to me. Yeah. The worst experience ever when you're panicking because Outlook cannot open. Because the PST file corrupted. That will never happen. A, a generation of computer users will never have to experience that ever again. Sure. And I know that we're stuck in our ways. I mean, if something works for you, it works for you. Something works for me, it works for me. There's really no right or wrong. It's preference. Paul, obviously, yeah. you write a lot more than I do. So something like Word goes a long way for you compared to Google Docs. But, you know, I could, I mean, I'm not going to, but... Um... A lot. There's a really good version of Word I could use on a Chromebook. You know, I'd have to be online. It's not like an offline app, but um, there is an Office online web app. You know, Word web app, Word online, whatever they call it. Um, it doesn't have every single feature of Word. You know, it's probably the top ten or twenty five percent, or however you want to measure it, of of Word. But it's Word, and it it works in Word format, and it doesn't bork documents ever. It's one hundred percent compatible. Um, I mean, as uh, words, words on the iPad, words going to be on Android tablets very soon. Um, even if you do choose, you want to stay in the Microsoft world for the document stuff, which I, I do think is important in some quarters, not just businesses, but some educational institutions and so forth. Um, you know, the, your options are expanding there as well. You, know, you don't they, have to spend hundreds of dollars. What do they say? It takes three weeks for something to become a habit. Yeah. Right. That's, a, that's so, an interesting. Essentially, yeah. like for me, I was a diehard uh, word user. I couldn't use Google Docs. It was it felt dumb to me. It was a dumbed down version. <laughs> I would have rather used Notepad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But somebody started sharing <coughs> show notes with me in Google Docs. And I decided I'm going to share my doc, you know, my show notes in Google Docs. And after that, I did it for a couple of weeks. And I have not installed Office on this computer. Uh, yeah. And you're it's been and about you are six, perhaps six, a more typical user in that sense, right? Yeah, six months. I haven't yeah. installed Office. It's been off since I formatted. Uh, and I pay I, you for know, it. I, I'm paying for Office still. My wife uses it. I mean, she she yeah. she uh, she writes a lot more than I do, and she does PowerPoint stuff. But uh, sure. essentially, I I could go about using Google Docs, and I'll be perfectly happy with it. Right. And by the way, that's true of a lot of people. So, you know, there's your issue. Yeah. <laughs> you know, for Microsoft, um, it, it, it's it, it's a very we're in this weird transition phase between the old way of doing things and a new way of doing things. And I think for a lot of people, it, it's, it's gonna, it, there's no right or wrong. It's going to come down to what are you comfortable using? If you're comfortable yeah. using Google Docs, go ahead. Well, I know people that use Notepad. They love yeah, Notepad. Yeah. It's, but, you know, we've talked about this before. This kind of, um, it's weird when you, when you think about technology topics and you bring in the notion of um, tradition, but you know, as is the case with, you know, religion or politics or anything else in life. I mean, a lot of we, what we do is bound by tradition. And we don't, when confronted by the question of, well, why do you do things this way? 
you you kind you find yourself almost flustered by trying to respond to it. Well, be, you know, I've always done it this way. I, you know, you don't really have an, a good answer. And when people say, well, you know, it's more efficient or better or whatever, cheaper to do this, you know, a lot of us are just kind of entrenched. I mean, I don't actually think that's a good reason to keep doing things the same way. I mean, I, I, I do think that as technology enthusiasts, you know, and, and as people who are um, influencing other people who are maybe just regular users, that one of the responsibilities we have is um, to really understand what's going on and, and to be able to give good advice to other people. And, and I, I try very hard to evaluate things over and over and over again. You know, it's one of those things I, I've started talking about this recently, but um, and you can see, you know, you noticed it. I wrote something about it, but you know, I, I break out the Chromebook. I use the iPhone 5s. I uh, this week I've been using a Nexus 7 tablet again. Um, you know, I change things up all the time, and I try to rethink, um, you know, whether everything I do is is the best, most efficient, whatever. And, and is this something I can present to other people as a good idea? You know, I mean, I because it would be really easy to be like, yeah, I just use Word. You know. Listen, I think we well, should all switch to Corel WordPerfect. <laughs> I've tried it. <laughs> when's, the last time, when's the last time you use WordPerfect? <laughs> when's the last time you use it? By the way, you want to know which – there's one Office suite out there uh, that actually does a pretty credible job of emulating Microsoft Office. Um, and it's uh, – I think it's – they just changed the name of it. But I think it – is it LibreOffice or um, – It might be LibreOffice. It just changed the name. I'm Listen, I'm going somewhere. back to Lotus 123. Right. And you're going to go to WordPerfect, and we'll be happy. We'll be fine using uh, Lotus Notes. I don't know why I can't see it in my start menu. It, might be, it may be Libra. Open off and not open office. No, it's not open office. I shouldn't have even said that. I don't even know the answer to my own question. <laughs> God damn it. <laughs> Sorry. Maybe this was on a different computer. They have four mm. different versions of Office. I try, I try all of the open source, you know, whatever... Um, Office products and Libre. Office. Someone's saying it's Libre Office. But is Libre Office? Is, are they changing the name of it? I don't know. If they're not, that's it's not that one. Yeah. Um, I'll try to figure it out. Sorry. Yeah. But I mean, bottom line is whatever makes you happy. You know, my job is to complain, and my job is to cover this stuff. If I didn't, I'd be perfectly happy using you know, whatever I'm using, and I wouldn't even think twice yeah. about it. But I, I I overthink everything. That's what I'm. I get paid to do essentially. It's comment and, and make you guys think about it. You know, let, let let's bring in different opinions. Right. We're all we're all brothers here in this in this world. <laughs> we're all, we're right. all brothers. It's all a wonderful, yeah. big, diverse world. Yeah. Um, I the big story. Let's go into the big story, Paul. Now, what is the big story? Uh, the big story is hey, you could support us on Patreon. That's a big story here. Uh, if you want to if you want to help the show, if you enjoy the show. You want, to continue, you want to see us continuing new things and continuing to upgrade the show. We're going to be adding a whole bunch of stuff. We're getting a call-in system very soon. We're, we're, it's almost a done deal. I'm just waiting for it to arrive now. Uh, we're going to be doing phone calls. Uh, we're going to be doing a lot of stuff here on the show. I have a lot of ideas. And we could further these ideas into actual things and, and make it happen with your support. If you go to patreon.com slash whatthetech, uh, you could tip us whatever it is, whatever you want to do, a dollar, two dollars, five dollars, a nickel, 25 cents, whatever you want to tip us, uh, you could tip us. And it really goes a long way. We are at four hundred dollars a week right now. Um, I, I believe I had set the goal in May that in June we wanted to be at the end of June, we wanted to be at four hundred dollars. And I think we hit like four hundred and five dollars. So we went over the goal, which is unbelievable. Uh, let, let's let's aim for five hundred now. Uh, let's see if we could do that. And we could do that if you guys, you know, we have a lot of viewers. You don't have to, you don't have to tip a dollar. The dollar is recommended, but you could do less than a dollar if you want. If you want to help us out, you could do so by going to Patreon.com/slash What the Tech. Also, another way you can support us is using our Amazon link. You could do so by going to gfq.co/slash Amazon. That's gfq.co/slash Amazon. We also have a contribute page on our website, gfqnetwork.com/slash contribute. That uh, Suncast just posted in the chat room. Uh, Shout outs. Yeah, I'm going to become a hip hop station and do hourly shout outs at the top of the hour. Nice. That is what I'm looking to do. Uh, <laughs> shout outs, dedications, and requests. This one goes out to Julie. <laughs> uh, Julie is uh, on the road, far from home, and missing her. Hey, uh, before, before we continue, yeah, yeah go ahead. Um, I wanted to mention a couple of things. Go ahead. Um, 
uh, I, fi- I figured out the office I was talking about. Oh, what was I've it? I lost it again. God damn it. <laughs> um, what's going on here? How did I lose? Oh, uh, it used to be called Kingsoft Office. Oh, they, somebody wrote that in the chat re- room. Yeah, they rebranded it as WPS Office, although the version I downloaded still said Kingsoft. Uh, that one is the one by far of all of the uh, Office alternatives I've tried that is the closest to Office. Um, also, apparently, uh, Apple has added um, two step verification to iCloud. Um, which I strongly recommend. I've not tried it yet, but having used it everywhere else, you know, Google, Microsoft, Dropbox, whatever, um, something for you to at least look into. That's all. (laughs) These things just changed. Yeah. I just got an email from Patreon saying that I have sent out $11 on my Patreon. Sending one, I'm sending Cord Killers and Night Attack. And I sent it to two of my friends that set up a Patreon but never did anything with it. They just set it up, and apparently I had signed up to support them, and they just got a dollar from me. Nice. So uh, Mike and uh, and Nick, enjoy that dollar that you got from me for this month. Uh, Paul, let's go into the big story. Yeah. Uh, boy, this week, a lot of news coming out about the future of Windows. Uh, mm. Threshold is the code name. It, are, is it going to be Windows 9? Are they going to... Continue that was the plan. Uh, last I had heard, right, I, the name is in flux. It could they might not they might call it something different, but yeah, it's Windows nine. But, it's not going to be Windows eight something. But is it going to uh, be? Have they contemplated if it should be Windows? Is I've that, not heard that, but I, I don't. They're not going to leave Windows. Yeah. I mean, um, a lot of news. So where do we begin with this? Uh, Mary Jo Foley actually said it months ago that there were going to be different SKUs and there's going to be different. Yep. So it's nothing. Brand new, but I guess it's well, solidifying. Some new stuff. Um, it's kind of solidifying the things that we had thought it would be. Well, but part of the issue is that the plans are changing, you know, and and as time goes on, you know, things change, and and um, the cynics in the audience will say, "Oh, you know, you're you're making stuff up. That's why it's changing." You know, no, I mean, uh, Microsoft is trying to figure out this new world. It's not every three years we release Windows. You know, they. There are, uh, Mary Jo wrote a very important story today about serviceability. You know that in Windows, um, Microsoft has a formal contract with its users about support uh, that it has to maintain. And um, serviceability means if you're going to get updates, you need to be updated to that version. And yeah. in the old days, that was a service pack. And so Microsoft re- re- would release you know Windows whatever service pack whatever, and they would say if you want support, you need to be on this version. Now, that was this. That's how serviceability was and is measured, but now we don't have service packs. And so with update one for Windows 8.1, that's the, the the point of service. You need to be at least on update one. Going forward, you'll need to be on update two. If there's an update three, same thing. So, um, you know, that's changing. Um, we, uh, as we understood it originally at the beginning of the year, Microsoft was going to return the, or I should say, add a start menu back to Windows. Um, in, in Threshold, and it was going to allow those modern mobile apps to run in Windows. Um, they formally announced this stuff at Build in April, and at that time it seemed like th- they described it as an update to Windows 8.1, and uh, there was talk about how they were going to deliver this maybe in Update 2, you know, maybe at least the, the Start menu or whatever. Um, as of today, uh, what I've now heard from multiple sources is that the Start menu is a Threshold feature. It's not going to be added in an update to Windows 8.1. Uh, and it is, in fact, going to replace the start screen, um, which isn't as dramatic as it sounds. In other words, the way we thought of the start menu in the past was that we have a start screen today in Windows 8. We'll have a start screen in Windows 9. But for backwards compatibility purposes, if you want, you can forget that and use the start menu instead. Um, the way that Microsoft is approaching that is actually makes more sense, which is they have a single UI, start menu. If you choose to boot to the desktop and you have a traditional computer and that's how you want to use your computer, one of the options you'll have by default, it will use a start menu. Um, if you use a touch-based computer and uh, you don't really go to the desktop, or maybe it's not even an option depending on the SKU, um, the start menu will be used, but it will be full screen. It will look and work a lot like the start screen does today. Um, but you'll have the option to go between the two. Um, it's not. It, it will be. It will default to the one that makes the most sense, uh, just as they default to booting to the desktop or not, depending on what makes the most sense in your computer today. Um, but it's going to be a single thing, not a, it's not an option. It's not a, you know, a backwards compatibility thing. It's, this is the start menu is it. They're going back. 
They're going backwards. Start menu. So yeah. that's very interesting. Well, they're not going backwards. I mean, well, you know, it, it, it's evolving, but... Well, the determ- uh, I mean, it's going to be determined based on what kind of device it is, obviously. If it's a yeah. tablet, now, your, your experience is going to be totally different on a tablet than it is on desktop, which sh- that's how it should be. Right. Um, I'm just going down your notes. So there's different SKUs for different versions. Uh, different strokes for different folks. Different strokes for different folks. So <laughs> if I am on a desktop, Right, just yeah. a just a plain desktop. I will never see the modern UI unless you turn it on. Unless I turn it on, you know. I mean, some people may want that. I, I this goes back to the thing we were just talking about. So everyone wants something different. So, you know, Windows is all about choice. Um, Windows Eight was an anachronism because it was made completely differently from every version of Windows before it. Um, they didn't give you those backwards compatibility options. I, that was obviously a mistake. They're fixing it. Um, yeah, so by default, traditional desktop, say a tower PC, non-touch screen, you're going to boot to the desktop. When you hit the start button, a menu is going to come up. It's going to look like Metro. It's got Metro tiles on it and stuff, live yeah. updates and all that kind of junk. But it's going to be a menu, not a full screen silliness that replaces the whole display. Okay. That, right. That's the right decision. Uh, and we haven't seen this yet, right? We've seen a mock-up of the start menu at build. That's the, uh, is that the one that you had in your website? Because I posted a yes, link from Windows. That's from site. Microsoft. Okay. But that was not a functioning. It was just a mock-up. Just a picture. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, it's in flex. I mean, they're working on sure. it now. You know, I, and it looks nice. It's, it's, I mean, I, I like it. You, you can imagine that thing stretched out to full screen. It would look just like the start, the start screen does today. So, you know, it's not hard to imagine. Yeah. Uh, um, floating, floating apps. Obviously, yeah. modern applications float in Windows on the desktop, which is great. Um, I do that today with the third-party utility, by the way. It works fine. Do you really? Part. I didn't even um, know yeah. that. Yeah, modern mix. I mean, there's a handful of um, of modern apps that I run every day, and uh, actually, one of them. Well, actually, two of them are the calendar and the mail app. I actually use those for that stuff every day. Um, I use Xbox Music that way, and it's just you know, I, I have a big screen desktop computer. I mean, it it allows me to use them alongside other you know normal applications. So the huge change, and then we'll go into discussing you know. What I like about this, the huge change is going to be for <laughs> tablets and phones. Uh, yeah. The biggest change. Um, so essentially, Windows RT will run the way that we've been asking for it to run, where desktop does not exist. There's no desktop. <clears throat> well, yeah. I mean, I guess the way to think of this is it's it's the way we always sort of imagine Windows RT, right? Um, it's something they couldn't do right away because, you know, Windows RT is something that has to happen in stages. You know, um, you take a product as big and as thorny and as complicated as Windows and you recompile it for ARM. You, you can't just ship that thing. I mean, you, you know, there's a lot that goes into it. So um, they released Office Desktop on there and made it part of it because if it doesn't have Office, it isn't Windows to many people and that would make it a non-starter. But in the future... Office, Gemini, Office Touch for Windows, whatever they call it, um, the touch-based version of Office, like Office for iPad, yeah, but for Windows, um, most likely will be the thing that becomes comes with it, just like Office Mobile comes for free on Windows Phone today. Um, so we kind of, you know, that plus a file manager plus a couple of little utilities, um, you know, we don't need a desktop anymore. So are they we don't merging? Have a desktop on phone. Are they merging tablet and phone now? Yeah, that's what it seems like. And I, I don't know that that happens explicitly in threshold, like it's a hard stop, like we're done. But it's something that happens in stages. I was um, just chatting with Mary Jo about this today, and we were talking about universal apps, for example, which is one of the first steps. And we were talking about uh, Microsoft MVPs and how they used to have uh, different developer MVPs for phone and for cl- Windows client. And now they're all Windows platform MVPs. Um Though that's how this happens. Um, you do the developer stuff first. You know, anyone can get up on a stage and say, we're going to have universal apps. We're going to have this one app that runs on both a phone and on a tablet. It's going to be awesome. And, and Office is going to be one of those apps, you know? Yeah, okay. But you're talking about stuff that's happening in the future. When they actually ship a version of Visual Studio, where in the past they had a special version for phone and they had a different version for Windows, and now they just have a yeah. version for Windows, and it lets you create phone apps and it lets you create universal apps, you know, heads up, folks, it's real. Like, and so um, it's a step on the path. I mean, obviously, universal, maybe not, obviously, I'll, I'll tell you that it's a fact that universal apps could get more powerful over time and should and will. 
Um, but they have the basics of it built into Visual Studio now and into the uh, application types now. Um, threshold will be a step, you know, and maybe there'll be a further step after that. But are, not, we really at, sure. are we looking at are we looking at one unified app store? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that, the, by the way, the basics for that are, are happening now too. Are happening. Yeah. So yep. essentially, Windows Phone and uh, let's say an RT tablet. It's going to mm -hmm. access the same app store. It's not going to be two separate. It's not going to be like the Windows modern app store and then the Windows phone app store. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't, uh, you know, if you go to the uh, Play Store, for example, and you go to download, um, well, Facebook's a bad example because it probably works on everything. But you download any app. There, there's a, a little box you drop down and it will tell you it, this is compatible with these devices. Yeah. And it will list the devices you own. And you can find out whether it works. Okay. And of course, you may have a tablet, you may have a, a phone. In my case, I have you know a few of each, so it's a little more complex for, than for most people. So I get to see how it really works. And you know, sometimes apps work on phone and they don't work on tablets. You know, and I, I sort of expect it's going to be like that. If you're browsing the store from a phone, what you should be seeing are the apps that will work on your device. And then if you search for something that you know is available on tablets and it, you don't see it, it's because it's not available on the phone or vice versa. Yeah. Like that's how I imagine that will work. Um, there's no reason it can't work that way. I'm just, I'm just trying to think of, of a good example of an application that... Uh, okay, so let's think of a game. Let's think of a game, for example, yeah. okay? So whatever, uh, Paul Therott's Magic Castle, available yep. on Windows Phone. That but application, not on Windows. But yeah. not on yeah. Windows. So is it going to, are they going to have, you know, is it going to be available as a developer? Yeah. It's going to be much easier for you, obviously, to develop it for everything. But I would love that to be on the tablet, on the phone, and on the desktop. Well, you know, modern, modern UI. Right. So um, uh, universal apps are, by definition, new apps that are specifically designed to target both platforms. Um, if you did things the old way, you, you could make an app over here. You could make an app over yeah. here. You sell them in the respective stores. Microsoft has a licensing change that they've made where you can uh, tell your customers, hey, uh, we see you bought our app on this store for Windows. Now you get it for free on Windows Phone, even though they're actually technically two separate, completely different apps. Yeah. Um, honestly, I guess the, the side issue here, though, is that when Microsoft launched Windows RT and Surface RT, honestly, the biggest mistake they made in many ways was not allowing those devices to run Windows Phone apps. Yeah. You know, that should have been something... They did right away. And by the way, I'd argue almost certainly something they could have done right away. And in fact, they still haven't done it. And I don't understand why. But. So should the answer been, you know, with, with RT devices, should just the RT devices been a blown up Windows phone? No, I don't mean that. I mean, e even though uh, it's Windows, you know, it's really Windows. It's a different runtime engine. It's like the Windows runtime. Um, there's no reason that that thing couldn't run. You know, Windows phone has actually had two or three um, runtimes, I guess, for lack of a better term. That people probably aren't really that aware of, you know, it's like a silver time, a silver time, sil a silver light runtime, uh, like a .NET Compact kind of thing, um, WinPRT, and now like they're just calling it WinRT. It's the same, essentially. This it's not really the same, but essentially the same uh, runtime as Windows today, um, which is why you can have a universal app. But there's no reason that Windows RT couldn't run WinPRT apps, couldn't run XNA games, couldn't run Silverlight apps from Windows Phone Seven. There's no, it, it's just a you, it's 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 almost like a Java virtual machine, or I don't know what you want to call it. It's just a different runtime engine. Yeah. This, it, it could it's absolutely powerful enough to handle this. Um, you obviously have to do the automatic scaling for the screen size and resolution and all that stuff, but um, this could absolutely work. And games are an excellent example of where you, you could just turn, open a, a spigot, and you would have an, an immediate several hundred new awesome Xbox Live games running on Windows RT today if they would just do that. And I. I to this day, I have no idea why that hasn't happened. Talking about Xbox, uh, I have not seen any information on how Threshold is going to impact the integration between Xbox and everything else. Um, is there any information on how they are going to implement Threshold in Xbox and how that's going to change Xbox? Right. No, I've not heard about Threshold yeah. in Xbox beyond the very basics of there will be a Threshold yeah. wave upgrade for xbox one but i, I don't, yeah, I don't Th know. this has to be tough for them because now they're they're like they have to forget about everything that happened in the last two years mm -hmm. you know and, and they have to tell it's like us. when you make a sequel to a movie and it they had made some really shitty ones in the interim and you want to pretend those didn't exist yeah, yeah, like yeah. you're making a new halloween movie and it's you're like, like a, well 
we're going to pretend that Halloween three through six didn't happen. <laughs> so, Jason, we're going to make space. something. We're going to call it Halloween seven, yeah, or whatever. Jason um, Friday the Thirteenth X yeah. didn't happen. Jason X didn't, didn't right. happen. You didn't go to space. Yeah. Uh, that didn't happen. So yeah. you have to sort of pretend, you know, pretend a little bit, or at least explicitly state the right thing, which is you're doing this because you know feedback indicates that people didn't like this direction, so we're going to fix it. I mean, Nadala now. Credible. Nadella now is, I mean, he he's swinging, man. He's swinging and he's hitting everything because essentially he's just cleaning stuff up. Yeah. The next two years is going to be his cleanup, and a lot of people right, online. And, and you know, by the way, to, to be fair, um, it's not just him, right? So, in the devices part of the world of Microsoft's world, we have uh, Stephen Elop, formerly CEO of Nokia, um, doing that for devices. And maybe even more importantly, in the Windows side, which is like phone, Xbox, all of the client OS, and I believe still the core OS, um, we have Terry Myerson, uh, who formerly ran the Windows Phone division at Microsoft, or the Windows Phone part of a division at Microsoft. Um, this, all of this consolidation we're seeing, phone and, it's phone and RT, um, the new SKUs, the new, the new direction for Threshold, the Start menu, all this stuff, this is all happening under his... Um, team, you know, and and those guys are very important to what's happening at Microsoft as well. And and rightfully so. I mean, they they should be going into this direction. Uh, and it, it's almost like the the concept was, well, we need to we need to unify everything. So Windows, I mean, this is Windows, and this is what it is, yeah. and forget about the old and, and in with the new. And it was done to such an aggressive extreme. Sure. You know, it was it was. For for the average person, I, I mean, Windows 8, it has a awful, awful stigma to it. And people now are saying, well, you know, how come? Yeah. Because the, the rumor was that we would get, you know, the start menu back, obviously. Anybody could install a start menu now. But they say, well, why are they waiting to Windows 9? Well, they're waiting to for Windows 9 to rebrand this thing. Because it is a PR nightmare for them right now. Yep. And perception sells. I mean, that's what's going to sell your product. Yeah, you, you you know, if you're Microsoft, you kind of have to suck it up um, because what's going to happen is um, people are going to write stories and and you'll see stories on the news because you know it's still big it's still big news. Um, Microsoft apologizes for Windows 8. We'll never do this again. Uh, we're going to release a completely new product called Windows 9 or whatever they call it. Um, we're going to put that behind us. You know, you, you kind of have to just grin and bear it. Um, you know, it happened before with Vista when they went to seven. It will happen here again with eight when they go to nine or whatever they call it. Um, but whatever, it's fine. It's okay. And and to be fair, you know, as as we would have said of Vista too, a lot of the uh, you know the core bits that make Windows nine special, right? Uh, they all happen first in Windows eight. So uh, we can all we can sit here and trash Windows eight all day like we could trash Windows Vista. Um, but you know the. Windows 7 wouldn't have been possible without what happened in Windows Vista. And likewise, Windows Threshold wouldn't have been possible without, you know, what happened in Windows 8 too. So it's not all bad. I, mean, I want to be really clear about that. But, uh, yeah, you have to get over that perception hurdle. It's a slow burn. <laughs> it's, a, it's a slow yeah, It's like burn. a tire fire and uh, yeah. <laughs> it just won't go out. I, I have a question for you. Now, with yep. modern apps running on in desktop, what does this mean for the future of Win32 applications? Is it just going to become like a legacy application where it's there yeah. and we're going to support it, but we don't want anybody developing for that anymore? It's all this, you know. So, I don't know. I mean, I could only speculate. I, I One of the complaints I had, I've had over the past couple of years is, you know, Microsoft is making a lot of improvements to the modern environment because, frankly, the modern environment needs those improvements. But... If you're, you've just heard from users that desktop is important, you're continuing with the desktop. Um, why can't you improve the desktop environment so that it has some of the features of the modern environment and can interact better with those apps? So we're going to have floating apps on the Windows desktop. That's neat. I mean, how about making um, uh, or allowing at least uh, desktop developers to sort of touch enable their desktop apps and have them run in some kind of a full screen mode that was a real full screen mode yeah. and work just like a Metro app. And um, I really feel like that kind of work is important and should happen. And I have no information about that. I wish they would do that, but because it'll I get don't confusing, see how you right? can't improve the desktop. You know, I, 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 it seems like they have to. No, I agree with you. And I don't is is the the is Metro apps running on, on desktop 
a pro or is it a con where now there's two <laughs> form you know there's two different types of develop two different types of applications you yep. have the modern application and you have uh, win 32 is it is it i, I don't know i, I mean I, i'm not a developer and i don't know this is it more efficient of an application if it's the modern application I, what is it the doesn't matter I, to me it's just pragmatic you know if you Look, they, for very specific reasons, did not want to allow unfettered access to desktop applications in Windows RT. I, I get it. I, I sure. get that. I don't necessarily agree with it 100%. I think there are ways that could have gotten around that, whatever. But, I mean, imagine how much more useful Windows RT was would be if you could run iTunes on it, if you could run Chrome on it, if you could run Photoshop Elements on it, you know, whatever. Um, okay, so they didn't do it. Um, but, you know, you have an Atom tablet. And maybe my music collection is in iTunes. Why can't I? I, I can run iTunes on that. I mean, um, what? Not that Apple would take advantage of this, but what if you made it possible for them to make uh, just to slightly modify an existing app? No, don't create a new app and a new API. Nobody wants to do that. We get it. But make a, a slightly more efficient version of your app that works well with touch. Absolutely. You know? Yeah. Um, I'm not again. I don't actually think Apple would take advantage of it. They're Apple, but if you made that a possibility. I, to me, that's just friendlier to both users and developers, and and I think good things can happen. It doesn't, it doesn't have to be an either or all the time. Yeah, um, mm. we're gonna see the preview. Mm -hmm. uh, there's gonna be a developer preview out uh, this fall. Now, the other the other weird thing going on is that they have upped the release for Windows. It's no longer gonna be released in the fall. It's gonna be released in the spring, in April. Uh, no, that's always been the case. No, no. I mean, I mean, in the past, Windows came out in the fall. Oh, I got you. Yeah, th yeah. This version of Windows is always aimed. Always at aimed. Yeah, for yeah. April. Uh, yeah. So, I'm assuming they're going to have a big unveiling of this, right? Sometime in the I was, fall. I, I don't know, but yes, I would imagine. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm, I, I, we were talking and uh, on on Skype, and I'm excited for this because this brings a lot of people to upgrading again. You know they're gonna they're gonna actually consider leaving seven for this, even if yeah, even if right. the the changes right. are minor, yeah. right? Like even though the start just for the start menu, I could tell you people are gonna jump just for the start menu. Well, some people might look at it and say that's not the start menu I know and love. Um, it, that start menu is a little too metro way for me. This is the thing I didn't like about Windows Eight. I mean, we'll see. I I, uh, I feel. I mean, that's not, maybe that's right. I was going to say, I feel bad, but maybe that's not the right way to say it. But it's too bad that there's a pretty large group of people ignoring Windows 8 because it's kind of touch-based. And, and that's they, me. They see it as something that's not compatible with what their work style. And that's me. I'm one of those. But when, in fact, Windows 8 has a laundry list of new features that benefit desktop users directly, uh, runs more efficiently on the same hardware, uh, you know, gets better battery life, yada, yada, yada. I mean... Honestly, if you if you can get by the Metro stuff, which is getting getting easier and easier as we move forward, uh, Windows 8.1 in particular, Windows 8.1 with Update 1, Update 2 may have minor user experience changes along these lines as well. Um, I, I hope that the people who have kind of ignored Windows 8 en masse will give it another chance because they're missing out on stuff that's actually really excellent that they just don't even know is there, which is too bad. Uh John says, uh, these people will not, on, on Twitter, these people will not move unless the start menu looks slash works exactly like Windows XP. Uh, yes. And I, <laughs> I think yeah. a lot of people, listen, <laughs> I, I, and I understand that. I totally understand it. It's but not going to look there, like there has <laughs> so. to be There has to be some sort of evolution to the desktop. There has sure. to be. We can't be running XP for the rest of our lives. It's a 15-year-old operating system. Um, right. Yeah. You know, we, we have to accept the changes at one point and and i think this makes it much easier to accept it than you know what we saw windows 8 uh, i i'm curious on what other changes we're going to see in the desktop you know just the ui itself what what other changes what what else are they bringing from the modern ui into desktop you know one thing that one thing i was really disappointed that they never said specifically you know, you're going to see this much performance by going to 8 or 8.1. They never spoke yep. about the performance of the operating system, when in reality, I think there was like a 10% performance increase. Mm -hmm. And for a lot of people, that's a big deal. For, for people that count numbers, that's a huge deal when you're talking about an operating system upgrade. 
you see, you know, Apple does this every year where they're talking far more efficient yeah. and faster and 45,000% quicker sure. when you're launching the Safari application on an i7. You know, they'll, they'll break it down to this weird stat. Where, and, you know, for people, they're like, wow, look how fast it is. Um, I, I'm, I'm hopeful that this is going to be it. This is the one that we want. I, I think it's going to be fine. I mean, I, um, you know, I'm, I'm always worried about people's perceptions of things. And, of course, um, we've seen that with Windows 8, uh, which is too bad. But, uh, you know, it's, it is hard. And that's a tradition thing, too. I think, you know, people have muscle memory and they're used to doing things a certain way. And I think Windows 8 was too much of an explosion of different and they were just not happy with it. And, um, you know, unique among Windows releases, they didn't give you a way to use the old version if you wanted to, uh, the old UIs. And uh, Windows 9 will at least fix that kind of stuff. I mean, they're not going to bring back the old version, of course. But um, it's it's it, they've made a lot of steps in the right direction. And it looks like what they're doing in, in Threshold or Windows 9 or whatever is is more of this, more of that. And so I think that's something we can all celebrate. Hopefully, yeah. or at least most of us can. <laughs> also, according to Mary Jo Foley, uh, she says it's possible that Threshold will be a free upgrade for all Windows 8.1 users yeah. and perhaps even Windows 7 users. Right. Uh, so that would be the biggest apology ever from Microsoft yeah. right there. Can you imagine? I, you know, and it, is that a bad idea? You know, it is essentially they're going to give it away for free. Right? I mean, that, that's yeah. pretty much what they're saying. They're giving this away I, for free. I think what they should... I, I mean... Is it a bad idea? I mean, you know, they should do it for a set amount of time. Um, they could say, hey, for the next three months, upgrade away. It's free. After that, you're going to pay for it. And you would see a big <laughs> a big surge in usage right there. I can, you know, we're giving it away for free forever is a different story. I mean, one of the issues when, when you move to rapid release is, you know, right, we're going to have this big bang release, but then we're going to have quarterly updates or however they do it going forward. Um, they can't charge for that stuff. So when do you start charging for Windows again? Yeah, you know, I guess just as a part of a new PC, maybe. I well, know. I mean, the the whole the whole upgrading thing needs to change. Like Apple does a great job with their upgrade. I, I, I did a format on this MacBook the other day, and I blew it away. Totally blew everything yeah. away. And yeah. as I was booting, so I rebooted and it said, "Hey, I don't see an operating system. You want to install one? <clears throat> sure. Let's connect to the server at Apple. It connects to the server, uh, and it downloads the latest version and installs it. Clean. That's it." You know, for a long time, we, we, we could have made the argument that, um, you know, you paid for that privilege, and you did. Um, Apple hardware prices have come down pretty dramatically in some cases. Um, really good Windows Ultrabooks are just as expensive, if, if not more expensive, than Apple MacBooks now. Yeah. Um, so it's getting harder and harder to defend the Microsoft side of this equation. But I, I think, obviously, my, uh, Windows has great, re, you know, recovery tools and all that kind of stuff, uh, very quick. Uh, built in now, Windows 8 up. Um, nobody's 